Well, the Vatican is a, uh, a principal financial power because in 1824, the House of Rothschild was appointed the sole fiscal agent of the entire Vatican Empire. And that's been going on since 1824. And since 1824, the House of Rothschild has pretty well uh, run the Vatican. So, so the globalists or the Rothschild family run the Vatican, or the Vatican is really employing them as agents. Well, they have to they have to work with the Rothschilds to stay alive because the, the Rothschilds control all their money. You see, some of these old families that go back to the Roman Empire yeah. had some of the biggest mansions in uh, in Venice and Italy and Rome and so forth, and uh, therefore uh, these these people have survived and they're surviving. By using their same old techniques of staying close to power, using money as power, and uh, they go sailing right on. For most of Jack Parsons' adult years, he was an adept of occultism and a distant disciple of Alistair Crowley. When Crowley visited California, and gave the go-ahead to form a new chapter of his OTO, Satanic Secret Society. It was Pasadena, the hometown of Parsons, which was chosen. From his pulpit in Brooklyn, New York, charlatan priest Charles Taze Russell prophesied that from October the 2nd, 1914, the beginning of the end of humanity would commence with the emergence of the Antichrist and Babylon the Great, as foretold in the Bible's Book of Revelation. Jack Parsons, born on that prophetic day, would later attempt to invoke the incarnation of Babylon and also sign an oath stating that he was indeed the Antichrist. On a 40-day pilgrimage in the Mojave Desert, the place where Area 51 now resides, Parsons summoned forth Babylon, the Scarlet Woman, the Whore of the Apocalypse, the consort of the Great Beast, Satan 666. According to the mysterious Freighter H, so who was the mysterious Freighter H? none other than the author and inventor of the new cult religion of Scientology, Mr. L. Ron Hubbard. During the ritual, he saw Parsons rip a hole in space-time, and something evil flew in. Her little pastime was calling up, supposedly filling the sky with UFOs and watching everybody's excitement. And some of the most outstanding sightings were in the early 70s in Ohio. And she used to laugh about it because she'd be standing in a circle out in the field somewhere calling up demons. And that's all they were, were angels of light playing games in the sky. Remember, a demon... Get the little spooky picture. There are a fallen angel, an unclean spirit. They can assume any form or go into anything. But they can, they can assume forms, including spacemen or solid objects like flying saucers or so on. That's why when they appear on the radar scope and a jet gets up there, they vanish right in front of the palace eye because they're nothing but a spirit.
Light there was in ancient Atlantis, yet darkness too was hidden in all. Fell from the light into the darkness, some who had risen to heights among men. Proud they became because of their knowledge. Proud were they of their place among men. Deep delved they into the forbidden and opened the gateway that led to below. Sought they to gain ever more knowledge, but seeking to bring it up from below. Opened they then by their knowledge pathways forbidden to man. Built in his temple, all seeing the dweller lay in his aguante, while through Atlantis his soul roamed free. Saw he the Atlanteans by their magic, opening the gateway that would bring to earth a great woe. There is, there we are talking about opening this gateway, opening up a portal. Of course, Quetzalcoatl and uh, uh, Toth are supposed to be the same person, as well as Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice born. The Mayan said that in December 2012 that a serpent rope is going to emerge from the galactic center. And from out of that serpent rope is going to emerge a god of enlightenment. Let's talk about the image from the Codex and the image of the LHC. It is very strange that in end times or now, we are using the LHC to open tiny doors that could exist between our worlds. But look at the similarities in the images. When we look at the side view of the Mayan Codex image, we see this serpent rope which is in sections, and each section has a flap. It is also in somewhat of a circle around. This view, down the throat of the serpent rope, they call the spoked wheel. Note it has eight spokes. But as we take a look at the frontal view, we see an even more stunning match. Not only does the spoked wheel look exactly the same, but you can count eight spokes on both, the codex and the LHC. This is very amazing. Here is a codex, possibly one to three thousand years old, which predicted when this would come to exist, what it would be used for, and a mug shot image of both fully frontal and a side view. Like the prediction, it exists now. At the end of the 13th Bactu. The Mayans said that in December 2012 that a serpent rope is going to emerge from the galactic center, and from out of that serpent rope is going to emerge a god of enlightenment. We could make black holes, for instance, that way. We could make a complete series of new particles. We could make wormholes, which are little holes in space-time in which you can go from one point in space and time to another point in space and time. Travel to another uh, time. Carl Sagan, and maybe you can address a question that I've had about uh, his book and the movie Contact for a long time. In that movie, if, if you recall, there was a blueprint for a device that was beamed to Earth in a consortium led by a character named S.R. Haddon construct what turns out to be some form of a particle accelerator for opening a wormhole. And of course, in the movie, uh, Jodie Foster's character goes through the wormhole to the center of our galaxy and then returns. Yeah, it was a hyperdimensional transit device. Exactly. This is, to me, highly rep reminiscent of what we see in terms of the gateway experiences of ancient kings in Samaria, ancient Babylon, including the Assyrian king who rebuilt Babylon, whose name happened to be S.R. Haddon. I mean, the whole thing is, is kind of like a Shakespearean tragedy. 
But the bottom line, the, the underbelly of it, I believe, you know, it has nothing to do with democracy, has nothing to do with the torture chambers and the prisons and, you know, his, his mythical weapons of mass destruction. It had to do with what was in that museum. And you and I, as far as I can ascertain, were the only two people anywhere on this planet before that invasion who said that's the reason we're going. Well, of and course. that's the key. Well, it isn't that, it's never an of course with it. You know, <laughs> in science, you're always dealing with ambiguities. But in this case, remember, science is nothing if it's not prediction. We predicted in front of 20 million people on another radio program, I will say it, Coast, uh, that um, that was going to happen. And lo and behold, it did happen. And then it was kind of taken away. You know, the artifacts, the, the, the glittering artifacts, the gold and the masks and the you know, the diadems and the the kind of trinkets that people all go gaga over, a lot of them came back. But the real prize, which has not returned, was the looting of over 80,000 cuneiform tablets, cylinder seals, etc., in the basement archives that were gone in and, and, and deliberately yanked out of there by people who knew a, where they were, and B, what they represent. And so to me, the reason for this war seems to have been the knowledge base that Saddam had been quietly accumulating. Um, you talk about Iraq, and you actually say that the reason we invaded Iraq was to get control of a piece of technology. So I think that's a good place to start, Len. Why don't you take it from there? Okay, well, uh, you know, I didn't just pull that out of the sky, uh, that idea. That was based on the, on the writings of Michael Sala and uh, William Henry. The, the National Museum of Baghdad had in its possession 5,000 so-called cylinder seals showing ancient scenes from Mesopotamia. So uh, Salah's theory, and I guess he based it on a lot of research, was that we wanted to get our hands on that Stargate, and that was the real reason for the invasion. Project Sigma and a new Project Plato through radio communications using the computer binary language, which the aliens understand very well, they're very mathematical minded, was able to arrange a landing that eventually resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. In 1945, an earthenware jar was dug up in a cave west of the Nile near the village of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Contained in this jar were papyrus scrolls and codices wrapped in leather of biblical text dating back to around 400 AD. Translations of these Nag Hammadi scrolls revealed a body of early Christian teachings that are considered to be Gnostic in character. In other words, these texts contain Gospels that had escaped censorship or revision by the Church of Rome. Contained within these lost texts is an exotic description of the origins of Earth and the human species that serious religious scholars dismiss as mythological science fiction, a fantastic and disturbing description of cosmology that reveals an intrusion upon Earth humanity by malevolent parasitic extraterrestrial invaders who use earth humans as puppets in a vast centuries-old game of deception and domination. And how do the Gnostic texts describe these invaders? Referred to as Archons, they come in two distinct types, an aggressive reptilian humanoid and smaller passive creatures resembling a prematurely formed fetus.
Did Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party have help from a higher knowledge than man? There are scholars and believers who now think they were guided by the alien grace of our modern UFO phenomenon. They insist these aliens have been visiting Earth for thousands of years. Do not be deceived. I believe the form of the alien grace is their true form. Being stripped of their apparel, they go naked and they have horrible faces. This sounds very much like the condition in which they were condemned by God. Dr. Jacques Vallée has addressed the United Nations on UFOs and was the model for the Lacombe character in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He is the author of eight books about UFOs and has been widely recognized as the premier researcher in ufology. In his book, Messengers of Deception, he says, an impressive comparison can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons. In his book, Confrontations, he writes, the medical examinations to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. This, this grand plan is, is, is going to take people, people are going to eat the stuff. Because it says spirits, demon spirits, will declare themselves to be inhabitants of far distant planets in the galaxies that are coming to warn the inhabitants of planet Earth of the impending destruction of the planet. But now they are known as alien grace, arriving from another planet and here to help man. Unless something seriously proper is done to avoid it. And he went on saying that uh, uh, they will claim uh, to have out-of-body experiences. Are you familiar with out-of-body experiences? Mm -hmm. I've read about them. In other words, so a person's, uh, there's some persons are supposed to be able to, you know, uh, they believe in their immortal soul. Astral immortal soul projection. Pro yes, right. Goes in two different parts of the world and sees things and come back and then they write all about it. You know? So, <laughs> due to the fact that the millions of the earth people believe in having people having an immortal soul. It has to be readily, readily accepted when the spirits will, through a trans medium, converse with influential people of the land, you see. Now, what is a trans medium? It's a channeler today. What, what is known today as a channeler? A channeler, yeah. Okay. This man is retired Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, U.S. Air Force, and former head of Project Blue Book. It seems a retired Rear Admiral had information about a woman in Upper Maine that purported to have established contact with extraterrestrial beings. Two Naval Intelligence officers were sent to investigate. The Naval officers met with the woman, and she went into a trance, supposedly to establish contact with the purported extraterrestrials and then they asked her scientific and technical questions that a woman of her education could not possibly know the answers to yet as the questions were put to her she was able to answer easily with seeming telepathic help from these purported extraterrestrials according to the report she indicated there was an organization OEEV which meant Universal Association of Planets and that organization had a project, UENSA, meaning Earth, which was being conducted. Then an unexpected turn took place. One of the naval officers was informed by the woman that they, the extraterrestrials, were willing to answer questions directly through him, a naval commander and intelligence officer with no prior experience in telepathic communication. He took over and attempted to write down the answers to questions put to him by his fellow naval officer. The word traveled back quickly to Washington officials and a very skeptical CIA. Nevertheless, there was no reason to totally disbelieve the report of this highly respected Navy commander. Questions were put to him, such as, do you favor the government, religious group, or race? 
and would there be a third world war? The answer to both was no. The group then asked if they could see a spaceship and the commander, still in a trance, told them to go to the window and they would have proof. The group moved to the window where they supposedly observed a UFO. I was told that a call was made for radar confirmation. The reply came back that that particular quadrant of the area was blanked out on radar at the time. There's another group of mediums who channel material that is related to extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial beings and it claims that it comes from the science of these beings and that if we adapt that science, we will learn a great deal about higher technology than we have. Of course, the Nazis being interested in power quickly bought into that and the more desperate the war became, the more they wanted to do aircraft in tune with these, uh, these mediums who were transmitting the, this material. They have been stripped of their apparel. They go naked. And they have horrible faces. This is a quote from an early Jewish writing called The Book of the Cave of Treasures. It tells of fallen angels and their bastard children called the Nephilim. And the very word Nephilim does not mean giants. It comes from the root Nephal, fallen ones. God destroyed the Nephilim's bodies and doomed them to wander the earth in an invisible dimension, and they are still terrifying men. The Apocrypha and early Jewish writings expound on these evil spirits. The Book of Enoch tells of their giant stature and how they manipulated the genetics of man and animals in every imaginable way. In other words, no stone was left unturned in their evil experiments. the altering of human DNA. Most people are not even aware of what is going on behind closed doors. Scientists are actively manipulating the genes of animals and man under the guise of improving humanity. We are shifting to a trans-human base. We've come out of a humanist time and now we're redefining what it is to be human. Whether we like it or not, we're becoming cyborgs. We're becoming transhumans. We have the opportunity now to try to do things uh, better uh, than uh, nature has done. Why not have a stronger arm than we have? Uh, you know, why not be able to run faster? Why not be able to have uh, tougher skins? If you're going to replace your eye for vision, uh, why limit it? Uh, to visual, why not give it the kind of vision a bat has, give it ultrasound. Could you imagine a Versace body design? Can you imagine a Terry Muller body design? These individuals, the late Versace was an incredible designer. What if he was a transhuman? What if he was an artist who really wanted to combine art and science? I bet his designs for a future body would be astounding. We take two sets of genes and we shuffle them and something comes out. Sometimes it's a wonderful product, sometimes it has a hole in the heart, sometimes it has psychosis or uh, tendencies towards you know, extreme anger, uh, has addictive problems, can't concentrate, all kinds of de defects. This last man has completely reversed morality, saying transhumanism is the moral thing to do, when in fact it is the exact opposite and the very thing the fallen angels and the Nephilim did in the days of Noah. Just like the Nephilim, they were altering the genetics of man to produce this hybrid Aryan culture again. 
They were also murdering all those who didn't fit into their society. The Nazi doctors at the death camps tortured men and women and children and did medical experiments of unspeakable horror during the Holocaust. Victims were put into pressure chambers, tested with drugs, castrated and frozen to death. The children were exposed to experimental surgeries performed without anesthesia. There were blood transfusions from one to another, isolation endurance and reaction to various stimuli. The doctors made injections with lethal germs and did sex change operations and removed organs and limbs. The angel of death, Joseph Mengele, carried out transfusions, sewed twins together and castrated or sterilized them. Many twins had limbs removed in macabre procedures. The idea around what we are doing in the genetics right now of humans, animals, plants, all, cease to, all seems to be an all-out assault on God's creative genius that goes back to that Genesis prophecy. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. But in the meantime, something else happened. In the meantime, a race of human-looking aliens contacted the United States government. Where this happened, I do not know. I wish that I did. This alien group warned us against the aliens that were orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as the major condition. For the first time in its history, the Earth had been assaulted by a man-made weapon of incredible power. One so terrifying, it left even its creator Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, shocked and shaken. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. But what if it had all happened before? What if an explosion of even greater force and destructiveness had long ago shaped the Earth's history? Some people have suggested on the basis of a number of lines of evidence that there may have been atomic warfare, atomic bombs, atomic explosions in the very distant past. Atomic warfare among ancient civilizations may sound like something out of a science fiction novel, but descriptions of similar deadly occurrences can be found in the very same text Dr. Oppenheimer quoted after the New Mexico atomic test. I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds.
at night. Jack Parsons would hold sex magic rituals in his house in Pasadena and initiate fellow scientists at the Los Alamos Atomic Bomb Laboratory. Jack Parsons was fully aware of what his rocket designs would eventually be used for. Not far from Jack Parsons' rocket lab in Pasadena, Robert Oppenheimer was building the world's first atom bomb, which would be exploded at Los Alamos, near a place called the Road of Death, which lies on the 33rd degree parallel. Part of an ancient Hindu scripture known as the Mahabharata. The Bhagavad Gita was written sometime between the 5th and 2nd century BC. This massive 100,000 verse text contains stories about the ancient empire of Rama, which it is said existed over 12,000 years ago. They had what was called a Brahma weapon. There were many people that were singed and burned and, and melted by the Brahma weapon. Theorists believe the Brahma weapon was an early nuclear device because the descriptions of its deadly after effects are eerily similar to the effects of exposure to intense radiation. One reference that we have, for example, speaks of these explosions that were brighter than a thousand suns. And when these blasts occurred, the suns were twirling in the air. Trees went up in flames and there was just this mass destruction. After those blasts, people who survive started to lose their hair and nails started to fall out. I mean, right there, we have a concise reference to radiation poisoning, nuclear fallout. And those texts are thousands of years old. What they found in these cities, Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Cote Digi, others of these Harappan cities, they found people just lying dead in the streets. It was like some doom had just taken over these cities. When an atomic bomb explodes, the heat is so intense that it melts the silicon in the sand into glass. There are some reports that such fields of fused sand of glass have been found in places including India. But if they do exist, this would confirm the descriptions given in the ancient Sanskrit writings that the people of those times had weapons resembling our modern nuclear weapons. They were called Brahmastras. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle the technology which we then possessed, and has not that been true throughout our history. They believed that we would use any new technology to destroy each other, as we always have. This race stated that we were on a path of self-destruction and we must stop killing each other, stop polluting the earth, stop raping the earth's natural resources, and learn to live in harmony with each other and with nature. These terms were met with extreme suspicion, especially the major condition of nuclear armament, disarmament, and I have to say that I could not blame them in the face of so many uncertainties and so many alien surprises staring them directly in the face. It was believed that meeting that condition would leave us helpless in the face of an obvious alien threat. We also had nothing in history to help with the decision. Nuclear disarmament was not considered to be within the best interest of the United States, and the overtures were rejected. There was a deal on the table to, to exchange abduction, certain amount of abductions per year, 
that were allowed to take place in exchange for technology? That was the second agreement. That was the second meeting with Eisenhower. The first one was with the so-called Nordics or the, uh, the extraterrestrials that basically looked just like us. Uh, you might call them the Pleiadians or the uh, Arcturians. They were part of a whole different group. You might call them the good guys. Okay, fair enough. They tried to make an agreement with Eisenhower. The only stipulation they had was that we give up our nuclear weapons, whereas they could help us achieve a much higher level of spirituality, and they would then give us their technology in terms of medical, biotechnology, all the things that would have made this planet basically a utopia. In Florida, there was the Blue Star um, Warriors. They landed and they offered um, their assistance too. They wanted, uh, they told them, they warned them that a deal with the Greys would be a disaster. You need to follow your own path. Teach peace and harmony and the men would have to disarm. And the military said no to that deal. Later in 1954, the race of large-nosed gray aliens which had been orbiting the Earth landed at Holloman Air Force Base. It happened in 1954, ladies and gentlemen. If you take everything that Bob Immenegger has ever said and subtract 10 years from it, you will be right on the money. A basic agreement was reached. After being briefed on all of the details, I asked the commander if he would attempt to contact me. He sat for several minutes and then appeared in the deep trance with his Adam's apple moving up and down rapidly. Questions were put to him and he answered them by printing in rather large letters using rapid but jerky motions. It wasn't at all like his natural hand. During the course of the questioning, we learned the names of some of the so-called extraterrestrials. One was Krill, C-R-L-L-L. -L -L. Another, Alomar, A-L-O-M-A-R. And another, Alpha, A-F-F-A, purportedly from the planet Uranus. An alien named Krill was left as a pledge that they would return and formalize the agreement. He was a hostage. Now the Greys, they have a Krill ambassador. Their uh, logo is an equilateral triangle. This race identified themselves as originating from a planet around a red star in the constellation of Orion, which we call Betelgeuse. I believe that that's a lie. They lie a lot, and they deceive a lot, and it is evident through every action that they've ever done with us. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, these creatures might be from Mars, really. They claim that they are from a planet which revolves around the red star, which we call Betelgeuse. They stated that their planet was dying and that at some unknown future time they would no longer be able to survive there. This led to a second landing at Edwards Air Force Base. The historical event had been planned in advance and details of the treaty had already been agreed upon. Eisenhower arranged to be in Palm Springs on vacation. On the appointed day, the president was spirited away to the base and the excuse was given to the press that he was visiting the dentist for a toothache. Collaboration with modern governments began as early as 1933 with the Bavarian Illuminati and Thule secret societies. And this collaboration was brought into America via the CIA, which was established with the help of American Nazi agents as well as European Nazis who were brought into America through Project Paperclip and other operations. It was agreed that the aliens and the upper-class secret government would help each other, as agreed in the 1954 Griada Treaty. In 1954, Eisenhower met with the Greys, and uh, there was an, a secret offer, an exchange for people, uh, researching on people, and the Greys would give them technology. The Greys were dying, and they needed to um, inbreed. To, had they wanted stronger bodies, so they wanted to use humanity in order to do that. 
MJ12 brought into, was brought in to monitor the experiment in implantations. In California, there was a treaty signed with the Greys. A meeting is reportedly arranged between the Greys and President Eisenhower. Now, there was a meeting. President Eisenhower met with the aliens and a formal treaty between the alien nation and the United States of America was signed. At Holdeman Air Force Base. And this was with the Greys. At that meeting, supposedly there was some sort of treaty that was signed whereby they could take some humans for abduction experimentation but they had to be returned safely in exchange the greys would give us some technology purported witnesses to this event claimed that eisenhower was actually asked there by the extraterrestrials in order to make some sort of deal the meeting took place at the holloman air force base in new mexico the resulting agreement may determine the fate of the human race it is known as the Grieta Treaty. Experts believe this treaty gives the United States access to the Greys' advanced technology in return for the right to abduct and experiment on humans with the condition they are returned unharmed. But who's to say they kept their part of the bargain?
It seems a retired Rear Admiral had information about a woman in Upper Maine that purported to have established contact with extraterrestrial beings. Two Naval Intelligence Officers were sent to investigate. The Naval Officers met with the woman, and she went into a trance, supposedly to establish contact with the purported extraterrestrials. Then an unexpected turn took place. One of the Naval Officers was informed by the woman that they, the extraterrestrials, were willing to answer questions directly through him, a naval commander and intelligence officer with no prior experience in telepathic communication. He took over. 
and attempted to write down the answers to questions put to him by his fellow naval officer. After being briefed on all of the details, I asked the commander if he would attempt to contact me. He sat for several minutes and then appeared in a deep trance with his Adam's apple moving up and down rapidly. said somehow some kind of allergic reaction how long had it been there When does a person, how do they first contact you and why? What, what is bothering that person that they would seek you out to begin with? Well, they usually seek me out now. I mean, this is a, a <laughs> drastic difference than when I started this, but we've done 16 surgeries today. So uh, my name is known basically all over the world for doing this kind of research. But so when they come to me today, uh, t in today's uh, you know, date, Mm -hmm. They usually feel, number one, that they've been involved in the alien abduction phenomena mm -hmm. and that they have an object or that they might have an object. Okay. Sometimes we found in doing these implant cases that uh, the object moves. I want to stop you there for a moment because what you just said, I mean, you've traveled in this, you've witnessed it, but for the viewers who are listening to us for the first time, you just said the object moved. Can you clarify that the object moved away from you on its own power somehow? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. Most of the surgical instruments are stainless steel. And they're supposed to not have any kind of a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for whatever the reason, they seem to react with the magnetic field of the object. And uh, it's as if, you know, two like ends of the magnet are towards each other. Mm -hmm. And the object gets propelled somewhere else. Why these implants were still attached to the person, they seem to be giving off a radio frequency of about 300 gigahertz. Uh, this was uh, a patient who uh, had one in the wrist. This one, if I remember correctly, was uh, out of a forearm. Now, was that in a, a blood type serum? Or this is it, yeah, yeah. This is in the serum from the patient. Uh, we find that they um, seem to be quite happy as long as there's some preservative that's like the human body that it came out of. And we. Uh, we in the in at some point during the research we have to look and see what's going on inside the metal uh, so in order to do that you have to have pure clean metallic surfaces so the only way possible way we had of cutting it is take it to a specialized laser laboratory and they were after we told them what was going on and kind of the history of the object they were almost afraid to to try and cut it so, but they did set it up on an automatic sequence and we had to cut it with a laser. And then when you look at it through the electron microscope now, you can even see the cut lines. Like a, you know, like a saw had gone through it, the, the jagged edge. So that's how hard this material. What is this sample you're running, Steve? This is um, half of uh, uh, an implant that came out of uh, a guy's wrist named Tim Cullen. He's, uh, been an alien implant activist for some time now. Okay. Looking at the, uh, the sample chamber inside the SEM uh, scanning electron microscope, and here's our sample holder, and um, on top of this black carbon tape is the sample. It's very tiny, um, only about a millimeter and a half long, and maybe at the most half a millimeter in diameter. Thank <laughs> you. 
You state that the carbon nanotubes that are in these implants would be excellent carriers of electrical current. Do you have any idea of why this should be and what or how it would affect the host? Carbon nanotubes are like um, graphite, which has a delocalized electrical structure um, uh, and a, a sheet-like structure rolled into a tube. And um, the um, electronics of it work out such that the electrons are more free than in the graphite and there's also there's metallic carbon nanotubes and semiconducting carbon nanotubes and the metallic ones have uh, a much higher conductivity than graphite or even most metals and um, uh, we're, we're looking into an earthly science um, uh, using carbon nanotubes uh, as electronic devices you can make uh, uh, transistors and diodes out of the mm -hmm. semiconducting uh, CNTs and uh, you could use the metallic ones as the wiring of the device. Since the body's an, an electrical system essentially could yeah. the you know the own the, the, the host's electrical system be somehow powering these? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Lear thought that um, they were um, powered by the nervous system at first, um, but uh, it seems more likely at this point that they actually um, are powered by zero point energy. Uh, Dr. Kuntz and I were, were thinking that they were probably powered by um, by zero point energy. Uh, well, explain that. Energy what do you mean by the vacuum? That? Well, the the, uh, the um, the space-time continuum has tremendous energy in it, and over the years, inventors have found ways to tap this. There are several ways to tap uh, zero-point energy, and um, Dr. Kuhn's thought that the certain frequencies given off by these devices um, could be used to uh, uh, generate zero-point energy and self-power the devices, huh. and um, he thinks that they're perhaps giving off several watts of power um, in the radio scalar wave region. No that uh, it contains uh, meteoric iron because there's a uh, specific uh, nickel iron ratio in, in meteorites. So uh, that's the elemental analysis which is uh, part of uh, scanning electron microscopy. And the other thing, we can use it to take pictures. So we can look at uh, uh, a first few, maybe up to 10 nanometers just below the surface. Or we can crank up the beam, so to speak, so you get a heavy bombardment of electrons and we can start to take pictures that are 20 nanometers or 40 mm. nanometers mm. going down through the object. Mm -hmm. What did the SEM show you that was anomalous regarding the implants? Uh, we use the data and results and we can see uh, structures. Wow. Uh, structures like uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, you can see this is a structure. It's a smoking gun from the standpoint of academic science. Here we have something you can put your finger on, you can look at it through a microscope, feel it, touch it, test it, and it doesn't come from here. Mm. Mm. Fascinating. So what, what do these things uh, do? Uh, some think they could be behavior modification devices. Questions were put to him and he answered them by printing in rather large letters using rapid but jerky motions. It wasn't at all like his natural hand.
manipulation devices. This network was developed and initiated by NASA and controlled from the space station. It has worldwide coverage. Level 7 is even worse. Row after row of thousands of humans and human transgenic mixtures in cold storage. Here too are embryo storage vats of humanoids in various stages of development. Here many abductees are kept in small cages, unable to stand and hardly able to move, dazed and drugged, crying and begging to be killed. And we shuffle them and something comes out. Sometimes it's a wonderful product, sometimes it has a hole in the heart, sometimes it has psychosis or uh, tendencies towards you know, extreme anger, uh, has addictive problems, can't concentrate, all kinds of de defects. We then received our first alien ambassador from outer space, his name and title, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's absolutely true. His name and title was His Omnipotent Highness Krill, pronounced Krill, spelled K-R-L-L-L -L -L or C-R-L-L-L. -L -L. In the American tradition of disdain for royal titles, he was secretly called original hostage krill, or OH krill, so that Americans would not have to say, Your Omnipotent Highness. <laughs>